Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Surma Pod. This is the podcast for the Sports and Entertainment Risk Management Alliance. I'm the founder and CEO of Surma, Rich Lenkov. I'm also the host of the Surma Pod. Today, we are discussing an issue that is literally breaking in front of us. We're not going to cover the breaking news so much because it's happening uh, recently, but we are discussing a uh, very important issue dealing with whether student athletes are considered employees of universities. And for that, we are very honored to have Professor Michael Leroy of the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign with us. Professor, welcome to the Sermapod. Thank you, Rich. Happy to join you. So uh, in May of 2023, the um, National Labor Relations Board's uh, LA Regional Office filed a single complaint against three respondents, uh, University of Southern California, the Pac-12 Conference, and the NCAA alleging that certain USC athletes were considered employees of each of those three respondents under the National Labor Relations Act. Why was that done um, first and foremost? We could explain that. The NLRB's general counsel issued an advice memo. I believe it's called GC uh, 2021-08 in September of 2021. And she laid out in about 10 to 12 pages a theory of joint employment that would expose um, schools, not just private schools, but all NCAA schools to a joint employment ruling if, if her theory were tested and validated or upheld by a court. We have to go back, Rich, to 2014 when Northwestern University's football team tried to form a union. Um, they ha they actually got to the point of casting ballots in a representational election. The ballots weren't opened. Northwestern um, appealed to the um, full five-member NLRB panel in Washington, and they prevailed in a very interesting ruling that said the NLRB could not assert jurisdiction. And the NLRB's point was, even if a majority of athletes voted for union representation, the nature of a league, a sports league, is that you have to have rules of equal um, competition. So hypothetically, if Northwestern could go out and buy athletes, um, it would create instability. And the NLRB back 10 years ago talked about instability. So that seemed to block the path altogether because only a handful of schools um, are private that, that really play big time uh, football and men's basketball, which is essentially what we're talking about today, Rich. And so the significance of GC 2021-08 and its joint employment model is it, it conceptualizes the conference, which is a private entity, and the NCAA, a private association. So you have a private association, by her theory, setting terms and conditions of employment with a, here it's USC, it's private, but it would apply to public sector schools. And that joint employment model, if it were upheld, would be a workaround from the Northwestern situation. So what are some of the uh, theories behind the idea that student athletes at USC or elsewhere are actually employees? In other words, what are the uh, indicia of employment that the NLRB used in making this argument? Well, they were vague. Let me just put it that way. I'm currently writing a research paper on it, and it, they're very vague about this. Um, they're referring to a common law origin of the definition of employment, which gets to the right to control somebody's work uh, for the benefit of the receiving organization. And I should note, um, Jennifer Abruzzo, the, the, the general counsel, is right in stating that um, the uh, the origins of modern day statutory definitions of employment, they all flow back into common law principles. Where she's vague and where this is conceptually challenging is the NLRB, for example, the NLRA, the National Labor Relations Act, specifically excludes coverage for public entities. And so it's not clear just yet that her theory can be upheld. However, the economic realities, and as you know, Rich, that's a term that's used frequently under the Fair Labor Standards Act to in, in misclassification cases. The economic realities are that these schools make 
enormous revenues off of the athletic labor of their players that these these athletes, I almost said employees, <laughs> are in the service of the school and that this is integral to the business. Who can imagine USC without the Tro Trojan football team? Be a different place, okay? And you go on down the line with these major institutions. And so I think in that sense, um, her theory has traction. Also, the fact that, I mean, these individuals are, are getting paid. They're not getting paid in the form of a paycheck, the way most normal employees are, but they're getting paid in the form of free room and board and tuition at schools that are very expensive. In fact, you know, there was a great report that I saw recently. It was on one of the, I think it was on Real Sports, discussing, you know, how many spots at very high end, in some cases, Ivy League schools are going to what is commonly known as student athletes instead of students who would otherwise take those spots based on academic merit. So, you know, they are getting something of tremendous value as compensation for these services they render to the universities, are they not? It's a great point, and universities point to that. If I can just speak to the other side of it, that's not a taxable benefit. It's mm -hmm. not considered employment. Um, the athlete typically doesn't pay taxes on it. It's not considered imputed income and the employer's not paying social security on it. So it is compensation and it is in some cases fantastic. I mean, 80,000 a year times four, that's terrific. But again, our tax code doesn't characterize that as employment. Um, it, it gets a special treatment. And so, you know, that speaks to the ambiguity of what's the meaning of this compensation. And what we have to bring into the picture is the fact that now we have all of these programs have NIL collectives that are sitting just outside the door of the athletic department. I, I have a research project, Rich, um, that is looking at the interconnections between the NIL collectives and schools. 34 schools in the past year responded to my survey. To a school, everyone says there's no connection between our school and the NIL collective. Hardly a surprising result. But again, it doesn't match reality. When you see Hunter Dickinson moving from Michigan to Kansas for $2 million and having an open bidding process, um, how did that happen without the coaching staff at Kansas saying that we've got a spot for you and, you know, syncing up the collective? There has to be something that's behind the curtain there that's going on, at least in my view. I also have NIL data from one school that agreed to share its information. It's not my school, the University of Illinois. They, they requested and they insisted on anonymity. But um, the point I would drive home is that uh, by their data, they, in 2022 to 2023, Rich, in that academic year, they paid over $5 million. They didn't pay, I should correct myself. Their, their collective paid. It was booked on the NIL platform for the school and the school has a record of that information. So my way of looking at that is that's a proxy for a labor market. So to that point, the news we were referring to earlier that's breaking as of about an hour ago with the day we taped this is that the NCAA president, Charlie Baker, announced that he's calling for a new tier of D1 where schools can actually pay athletes directly. Does that, in your in favor or against the argument that student athletes should be considered employees. I guess you could look at it either way, really. Depends on your perspective, right? Yeah, so let's use the glasses half filled perspective, okay? So you and I are, are doing this at the, at the hour that this is breaking. So you and I have just a superficial sense of what's going on. Having said that, I don't think this is even the glasses half full. I think what this is doing, it, I talked, Rich, a moment ago about the, the, the um, contrived space between the NIL collective and the school, that space seems to have narrowed to nothing. So it, it can bring the NIL collective. My understanding of it, and again, subject to more information, is the NIL collective can still exist, but it can be funneled directly through. And it, it's just bowing to the reality of what this is. Is that employment? Not at all. Okay. Um, and again, let's just, let's talk taxes for just a minute. Um, you know, it's the student athlete is going to be responsible. That that person is responsible today to report that as income, and it's 1099 uh, income. 
that I assume that's going to continue. Is the school going to pay social security taxes on it? No. Is the school going to pay workers comp? No, et cetera. Can, can athletes form a union? No. Is there a minimum wage? No. So it doesn't do anything really to, to, you know, when we talk labor law and employment law, there are no indicators of employment in that development. So you've made a compelling, uh, explanation you've made, you've given us a compelling explanation why perhaps this initiative by the NLRB you know will or, or should fail but putting that aside what is the bigger picture here as the you know revenue coming from a small amount of D1 sports continues to explode as we see TV deals and as we see conferences actually you know getting smaller and disappearing the pack we just saw the last ever you know Pac Pac 12 championship over the weekend um, what's the future for the issue? Because certainly it seems like the momentum is in favor of compensating athletes more. After all, NAL deals are only rewarding a very incredibly small portion of, of D1 a athletes, right? I mean, the great majority of athletes aren't getting any NILs because they're not big enough names and the market isn't there. So what do you see as the future for compensating athletes if, if this initiative fails? Well, the big takeaway is the NCAA is losing and they're admitting it now. Yeah. They're admitting it. And really, you know, the, the dam is broken and they're trying to put their finger into the, the hole, but it's not a hole in the dam. It's a full on breach. And so today's measure um, is, is only going to ironically, I think, hasten the effort to, um, to recognize the reality that at least when we're talking about these premier uh, football programs and men's basketball programs, that they are that they, they meet the criteria for employment. Rich, I would also just say back to my NIL study, 90 percent of the NIL money is going to football and men's basketball. And that speaks to the point you made about other people aren't getting it. Um, other people are getting NIL deals that are like ten dollars for a tweet. You know, my son's having a birthday, I've got a favorite college player, would you send out a tweet or something? Not a football player, not a men's basketball player. Um, so the big picture, and, and if I could add one more quick thing, the, the Charlie Baker, who is the um, head of the NCAA and various high level college executives testified before the Senate about a month ago. And they were asking for antitrust exemption, which is an incredible ask if you think about it. And they were asking for legislation to shield them from an employment relationship and to preserve amateurism. I mean, I think they've given that up right here. Well stated. Uh, University of Illinois labor law professor Michael Arroy, thank you so much for updating us on this very interesting issue. And please come back on the Sermapod as this issue continues to develop. Will do, Rich. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it.